Man, it is so good to be in this room. I, I can't, I, I don't know what, uh, what happened when I walked in the room and, and there's just, it's rare that we're in a building like this, or at least that I'm in a building like this. And uh, there was just something so beautiful about the history, but then when I saw your faces and I, there was just something about being with the church, with other believers in this room in the middle of this city right here in downtown that I just got fired up, you know? It's like, The sense of here we are, the church of Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell will not stand against us. And there's a powerful force in this room. And so it was exciting to just come in here. And, and, and as I started to worship, I got excited and, and forgot all about the fact that I was wearing a suit. And um, <laughs> someone asked, when's the last time you wore a suit? I go, I don't remember. I, I got this like 15 years ago. and, and uh, I've, I've, I, I haven't done a funeral in a couple of years, and uh, I think, honestly, I think that's the last time I wore it. So it's funerals and founder week. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's good to be here, and um, I'm, I'm, I was up here praying, you know, because I've, I've got notes, but I, I, I always stray. And, I, and I, I pray, I go, Lord, what, what is it? What do you want? I mean, to talk about what is unique to this time, this place. You've given me different passages in my mind, but which one, which one am I going with? And, and um, I, I was um, a little, uh, take this in the right way. I loved the worship. I was a little distracted, though, because um, Irish people are so much cooler than we are. <laughs> you, you know, like... Seriously, when they talk, you know, there's just that, ah, oh, I wish I sounded like that, you know? I just wanted to hear her read scripture all night long, like, wow, it's so cool. It makes you so happy. Um, but then they sang that Kyrie song where uh, they asked us to sing in harmony. And let's be honest here, how many just had no clue what you were doing? Thank you. That was so distracting, you know, because I'm listening to the guys next to me and they're actually pulling it off. And I'm trying, you know, I'm just moving my mouth, pretending, oh yeah, I'm harmonizing. And, uh, but it's funny because in my house, I, I have five children, uh, four girls and, and, and a boy. And all of my girls, including my wife, my wife is a, is a singer. My oldest daughter, 16, just released her first album. I mean, they're all singers. But my 16-year-old, my 12-year-old, my 7-year-old, the three of them harmonize with my wife. So the four of them, I, I mean, she's seven, and she's hard. And I'll try to jump in, like, I think I hear a harmony, like, in my head. And I'll ask, hey, hey, wait, 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 stop. Is this a harmony? Row, row, row your boat. You know, or I'll, you know, I, I'll think I hear something. And they'll just start laughing. And... And, and, and I've been my whole life, it's so funny that she did that because my whole life I've wanted to harmonize. I've been trying to harmonize. Sometimes during worship, everyone's singing really loud and I'll just be there trying to harmonize on my own. And I remember one time, my, my little uh, microphone, what, it was actually in the monitors of the singers on stage. <laughs> And so I'm there trying to harmonize. You know, here's the pastor in the front row trying to harmonize to these worship songs. And the whole worship team's listening to this. And they're just smirking, trying to just stay on pitch. Because I can't, no matter how badly I think I hear. And I, I tell you, sometimes I come home, you know, I'm listening to the radio or something, and I'll run in the house, like, okay, listen to this one, listen to this one. Tell me this is harmony. I know it's a harmony. And I'll sing, and my girls will just start laughing. I go, that's not even close, honey. That's not even it, Dad. And, 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 and all my life, I've wanted to hear a harmony just once. That's all. I just want to get it. But the way I understand, you either have it or you don't. Either just hear it or you don't. And I guess as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about that's, that's exactly what Paul says about the gospel. Um, there are those who hear it, and it's like, this is the greatest news in the world. And others, they hear it over and over again. They're like, I, I don't get it. I don't see what's so great. That, 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 that sounds like foolishness to me. 
But, but, but even beyond that, something I, I learned during my years in Bible college, as I, as I was coming to this, I was trying to think back. I mean, it's been a long time. It was about 25 years ago that I was in Bible college. And, but I remember there were times in class when I would hear the Word of God being taught and it would just strike this chord in me that, that I just wanted to scream because I'm looking around going, man, are you guys listening to the same thing I'm listening to? Are you hearing what I'm hearing right now? Are you, are you understanding the cross? At times when I would focus on the cross and think about God sending his son. I mean, God, almighty, holy, this all-powerful God sending his son. And I'm going, man, do you, do, are you hearing this? Are you listening to this? Is it causing any type of response in you? And it's just like Jesus would say, he who has ears, let him hear. Some of you guys, you're going to hear, but you're just going to hear these messages and deceive yourselves because you're just going to go, yeah, yeah, no, that was good, that was good, I got it, I got it, I got it, but you do nothing about it. You deceive yourselves. You don't do what it says. Man, there were, I, I remember, I distinctly remember being in class and uh, an Old Testament survey and, and the professor, what, why is that funny? <laughs> What did I say? Did I say something? I don't know. So, is your favorite class good? Okay. No, so I, I say things wrong sometimes, and I, I don't know what I said. Okay. But Old Testament survey, get it? Um, and I, I was sitting in Old Testament survey. I still remember, and he was preaching out of, out of Amos chapter 6, and, and that first verse, it talks about woe to you who are at ease in Zion. And, and he was just talking about, you know, those who just felt comfortable, you know, being in this place because they were close to, you know, the, to God, you know, believe, being in the city or so they assumed they were kind of associated with him. They just kind of laid back and relaxed and they didn't care about the things that God cared about. They were too comfortable, too at ease. And I remember just sitting there in, in Old Testament survey going, man, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I got, I got to do something. Here I am sitting in a Bible college. All I'm doing is, is sitting around with people who believe like I do. And I was thinking, man, there's a dying world out there. These are things that God cares about. I got to care about them. And I remember moments like that when everyone after class was just going back to do their thing, go play intramural football, whatever. And I'm thinking, man... Did you guys hear what I just heard? I, I got to go do something. I got to make something happen. I got to try to care about the things that, that break the heart of God. And I remember just driving into downtown LA and just go, man, I'm just going to start talking to people. Man, just scared to death, 19 years old, walking around the streets by myself, just going, man, this scares me. God, you got to be with me. You got to walk with me. You got to just show me you're here with me and, and just trying to find anyone to tell them about Jesus. And uh, throughout my life, there have just been so many times where I would read this book and, and it would speak so simply to me. I would just hear something and go, I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to respond. And yet so many times I get that sense like I go do something and I get distracted or I justify why I don't have to go do that. Um, and it's such a wrestle. It's such a wrestle to be a doer of the word to not really hear it, just like I don't really hear a harmony. I can't, I, can't, I can't sing a harmony. At the same time, many of you, some of you hear the Word of God and you're like that good soil, you just immediately produce fruit and it, it happens. But I'm guessing there are a lot in this room who hear the Word over and over and over and over again, and yet you're not doing it. It, it's not striking that chord with you. You're not really hearing it. I, I, I was thinking about Ezekiel chapter 33 
In verse 30, he says, as for you, son of man, he says, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, come, hear what, what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act, their heart is set out on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. When this comes, and come it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. He says, you know, these people, they're going to come and they're going to listen to you. Just like they'd listen to a musician, they'd come listen to a comedian, they would listen to whoever. They want to hear this, but as much as they'll talk about, hey, so-and-so's here, let's go listen to his message, let's go listen to that guy's message, let's podcast this guy's message, he goes, at the end of the day, they're not going to do anything. I thought, wow, what a sad commentary. And yet I, I think we'd have to agree that happens all across America, doesn't it? Um, I, I really believe we live in a time right now where we have some of the best Bible teaching that I've heard in my lifetime. And it's right there at our fingertips. I mean, it's there and it's being listened to. And some days I go, man, I don't know what's better. I don't know if it was better when the preaching wasn't so accessible and so good and so you can blame it on the preachers. Um, or is it worse now that there's some good, expository, strong Bible teaching and many are listening to it, and yet the church still kind of looks the same. The actions aren't following. Um, can, I, can I just pray? I feel like I've got so many thoughts in my head, and I, I want to say only what God says, and I, this is my tendency as I just start talking and, and saying stuff, and have five thoughts in my head and just trying to pick one of them and um, that last song she sang about being still uh, can we just slow down and do that right now and and just acknowledge honestly acknowledge that there's a God in heaven right now who sees what's going on in this room who knows about my pride, who knows about my desire to be liked, who, who just knows everything that's going on, and he's, he's given us breath right now, he's given us minds to understand, and, and just to be in agreement that we want to please him when this is all done, that that would be the goal, that he would say, wow, that was, that was right on, that's what I wanted to happen in that room. Father, help me right now, God. Help me, Lord, to say whatever you want me to say. I get rid of any pride, any fear of man, any selfishness. May this be about your spirit, about your word saying whatever you want to be said tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was in the hotel right before I came here and I was praying about you know, I had written the message out, but I, I just prayed and said, God, what, what are you putting in my heart right now? And um, I, I had these two opposing thoughts. On the one hand, I was so excited about life. Um, man, I'm, I'm 44 years old. Um, I, uh, 
been married 18 years, have five kids, I'm living in San Francisco, and I have never been happier. I cannot think of a happier time in my life. I have never been more excited about ministry and the ministry that I'm involved in. Um, I, I've never felt so confident as, as a leader and a discipler of my family. Um, I, I've never been so at peace with, with, with my life and my relationship with God where I go, okay, this, this feels very biblical. This, this, this I, I feel is congruent with the scriptures. I'm at, at peace with this. And, and, and for many years while, while I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing God, you know how there's just that nagging um, lack of peace in there sometimes when you go, yeah, there's more though. There's more. There's, I'm, not, I'm not really living by faith. I'm not really becoming more like Jesus. I know I'm okay in other people's eyes, and I can pretty much justify anything. We can justify anything biblically, but you, you, you're not really going to Scripture and going, okay, this feels like the New Testament. This seems like something Jesus would be doing. This seems real. It's, it's starting to uh, be that way in my life. Uh, I mean, even after one of our Sunday gatherings, I, I was driving the family home and I asked them, I go, so what'd you guys think? And my oldest daughter goes, dad, that was awesome. She goes, it felt like we popped right out of the Bible. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a great way to phrase it. She goes, just the way, you know, we were knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus and serving those who were in need and, and trying to demonstrate. She goes, it just felt like we were people that popped right out of the New Testament. And I thought, man, you're right. It, it's, it's so, it's such an exciting, it, it's, it's a rush. You're going, okay, this is congruent. This seems like what they were doing in our context, in our day and age. So on the one hand, I'm so excited and I, and I wanna share those thoughts. And, and yet as I was praying, there's this other side of me that, that loves the church of Jesus Christ so much, but I have the sadness um, because, okay, Let me put it this way, if, try hard. I know some of you guys have been believers as long as you can remember, for a long, long time. But try to imagine if you were an unbeliever in America searching for God, searching for truth. Just try to picture yourself in that boat, because that's the people I hang out with now. Try to picture yourself as one of them looking for truth. What is the true religion out there? If you went in your mind, you thought, okay, who's the most radical? Would you think Christians? Probably not, probably, you'd think, probably Muslims. And you think, well, who's the, the knowledgeable, committed ones? Would you think Christians? No, probably Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, okay, family. Who's a picture of family and love? Christians? Mm, probably Mormons. And, and you know, this, this stuff that I go, man, but we can be all that. We, we're supposed to be the ones that would just give our lives, die for this thing. We're the ones that are supposed to just love and bear with one another and, 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 and you know, and, and, and fight for one another and be a one. There, there should be such a unity and a love amongst us. There should be such a knowledge of Scripture and a commitment and a willingness to do whatever. But it's not there yet. And there's just a sadness like, God, I want the church to be like that. I want to be like that. I think we, we all look at the scriptures. I mean, honestly, I, I, I think, you know, right before this, they were asking me for the, for the radio, why, why do you think crazy love took off like it did? And I said, you know, that, that was very weird to me because I was thinking this is just for a small group of people. But I said, what I realized was a lot of people have been reading this book their whole lives and they've seen that, uh, 
the incongruency between the way this book reads and how we live. And they're going, gosh, it seems like the simple reading of, you read about that early church and you go, man, look at the way they loved each other. They didn't have a single person in need and, and they, they would just, they didn't care about their stuff. It's like, man, whatever, mine's is yours. Let's just, let's just be about this mission. And there's this side of us that gets so excited, like, oh, I wish I lived back then. I wish I lived back then. What would it feel like to be with a bunch of people and just feeling so safe? Like, these guys are my brothers and sisters. Look at this group. We don't leave anyone behind. We're so in love with each other. And, and yet we've had scholars tell us, well, that was back then. That was cultural. Everyone lived that way back then. It, that's the way their society was. And I'm going, no, I don't believe that for a second. If, that, if that's the way it just was, then why do they make such a big deal of it in Scripture? That the believers began to sell their possessions and care for each other, just like everyone else did back then. Because <laughs> back then, everyone shared. You know, kids would grow up going, here, share this, here, have this. You guys, it's, it's just, it was a uniqueness about the church at that time that we can still have if we would take this book literally and go, man, let's, let's start pursuing this and looking at each other like brothers and sisters and, and fighting to live biblically. Man, I, I've been one of those who just, I look at the word and I go, gosh, it doesn't seem that complicated. Sure, there are those passages that are difficult to understand. There are certain things that we have to reconcile here or there, but the majority of it, the obvious teaching, I just go, man, it just seems right there, black and white, like this is how we ought to live. I, I remember the first thing we, we learned in, um, in, in our hermeneutics class in, in Bible study methods was that, that first law was, uh, if the literal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. <laughs> Remember that? That's what they tell you, or I don't know how you worded it, but that's what they told us. If the literal sense, if it makes sense, then just, just go for it. Rather than trying to explain everything away, just going, man, it seems like that's the way we ought to love each other. That if, if, it, if there's a lake of fire at the end, that day and night, forever and ever, uh, uh, that torment and just go, well, I, I, I mean, that's why I wrote the book, Erasing Hell. I go, man, I'm just reading this book and going, gosh, it sure seems like God is a God of judgment. It sure seems like he's pouring out his wrath. It's just we that try to neglect those parts of the Bible. It's, you know, I mean, this is the God that gr was grieved that he made man and killed them all, all of them. And, and, and we, we, we neglect that, go, well, if he's a loving God, he would never drown everyone? everyone? Is that how you're going to finish a sentence? I mean, you just go, wow, he is that God of judgment. And it's just that we mask it. And we'll, 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 I've talked about this many times, how, you know, in our kids' nurseries, we'll, we'll paint Noah's Ark, right? You know, with the cute little elephants and the, you know, with their trunks in the air and giraffes sticking out. And we don't paint the millions of people drowning. <laughs> I've never seen it. Someone do it, please. It's just a minor detail in the story that he killed everyone. But that's not palatable to our ears, right? Because our God is a God of love only. He is not a holy God. He's not a God of wrath. And I'm just going, man, did you really get that from the scriptures? Read it for yourself. Would you ever come up with that if you read this book on your own? Hey, okay, it's like this. The other, other week, it, it's probably three months ago, I was in my front driveway fixing some bricks and, and some Jehovah's Witnesses come by. And, uh, and, and they just say, can we talk to you? I'm like, man, I'd love to talk. Let's talk. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, these are human beings and, and I, and I want to care for them. And, and they start talking a little bit. I go, hey, can I tell you about some things that God's done in my life recently? I go, can I just tell you like a couple of answered prayers? And, uh, and, and one of the ladies goes, well, God doesn't listen to everyone. He doesn't hear everyone's prayers. And I said, you know what? You're actually right. 
Biblically, God says in James 1 that if you, if you pray with doubt, that he's not going to listen to that. He says later in James, if you pray with selfish motives, he's not going to listen to that. 1 Peter 3 tells me I better honor my wife as a fellow heir, the grace of life, so my prayers will not be hindered. So Amos 5 talks about how he couldn't stand the noise of their songs. Isaiah 58 talks about how you could fast and pray. And if you don't care for the poor, he's not going to listen to you. I just says, you're absolutely right. You know, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't listen to everyone. He says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. It, it, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a, what do you call those? Prerequisite, whatever, you know, like there's, there's things. <laughs> I can't think of the word. Conditions, there you go, you, you know, there's, there, you know, you don't, he doesn't, you're right, he doesn't listen to everyone. I go, but he listens to me. I go, let me just, let me just tell you one story. And I tell her the story about how God just supernaturally provided just a couple of days before. And, uh, and they're just like, wow. And then uh, one of them goes, you know, let's, let's leave. And, and uh, so I, I said, hey, can I, do you mind? I have more stories. Um, and, and I started walking with them. And I just started, no, not in any other than, hey, if you love someone, you're not going to just let them walk away. And so I'm walking away just telling stories about God's answered prayer. I go, man, ladies, you got to look at me and you got to admit there's something going on with he and I, right? Because this doesn't just happen. You said it yourself. God doesn't listen to everyone. Explain these answered prayers to me. And, and then one of the lady goes, what are you? <laughs> Seriously. She goes, you're one of them Pentecostal guys. And, and I said, don't even worry about what I am. I said, all you need to know about me is I'm a man. I'm a human being like you. And what I do is I open up that book. I open up the Bible and I read it for myself. I study it and go, man, I think I should do that. And then I pray to the God of that Bible. And crazy things have happened throughout my life to show me that that God in heaven listens to me. And, it, and it's such a rush to know that I'm in love with him. And, and she, she looked at me. And she goes, that's your problem. <laughs> I mean, verbatim, this is what she says, that's your problem. I go, what's my problem? She goes, you read that book by yourself. She says, you can't understand that book unless one of our leaders explains it to you. And I said, man, I go, that's your problem. <laughs> I said, seriously, I go, you are putting so much trust in these people who are supposedly your leaders and just let them tell you what to believe. I said, I am not telling you to listen to me. I'm saying get alone with that book. Okay, don't listen to me, don't listen to them. Just get alone with that book and trust the Holy Spirit of God that the Holy Spirit of God will speak to you and, and he'll open your eyes to the truth of that book. And I, you know, I, I don't know if I got anywhere with them. I, I pray for them still. Um, it's been a few months. You know, I still think of them. One of, one of the ladies' names was Willie, and I remember that name, and I pray for her every once in a while. Like, God, I hope she gets in the Word for herself and just does it and sees it. Because it's such a danger when we don't, study this book on our own. And those of you who are students here at Moody, man, this is what they're teaching you to do is to get into this book and study this book by yourself to where you open its pages and you go, okay, I get that. I get that. I want to go do that now. Because, uh, you know, I, I talk about uh, the years where I didn't really have peace. And it's because I spent so much time alone with this book and yet there are certain things that we as quote unquote Christians do just because we're told that's the way we do them here and now at this day and age. And we never really look into the scriptures ourselves and say, is that the obvious teaching of scripture? 
Because just like I said to those ladies, I said, look, your leaders are coming up with conclusions you would never come up with if you just read the Bible yourself. And I'm convinced that in the same way, maybe not to the same degree, but in the same way, many of us have come to conclusions that we didn't get from Scripture. We were just told these things. And as we were struggling with it eternally, we just, we have other people tell us, oh no, it's okay, it's okay, because we, we justify things. A lot of Christians do this. You, 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 you think, what do I want to do, and then is that okay biblically? And you figure out a way to make it okay biblically. I've done this. I, I, and you, you can, if you want to get a divorce, you can, you, you can justify it for any reason. You can justify it somehow. Pull a verse out of context, justify your divorce. You can go to a Christian bookstore today and tell them, look, I want to get a divorce. Here's the reason why. Can you find me a book that tells me it's okay? And it'll be there. I, you know, and, and I would look in, in things like in Scripture, you know, where, where it talks about, um, like, like, like Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel 16, where, where it says in, in, in verse uh, 49, he says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pried excess of food and prosperous ease, but they did not aid the poor and the needy. He says to Sodom, he goes, man, here's the sin. Here's the sin of Sodom. It was like she was so arrogant. And she was overfed. She had this excess of food. And she just lived in prosperity with ease. And she didn't care about the poor and the needy. And I thought, man, we, we justify all those things. You can be a Christian leader today and be arrogant, overfed, unconcerned for the poor and needy. Those aren't the things we look for. I, I look in the early church and, and Peter's first sermon when the, when the people were cut to the heart and they're like, wow, is that the gospel? Is that the truth? What do I need to do? And what does Peter say? He says, repent and be baptized and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet in this country, the majority of gospel presentations do not contain repentance or baptism or the Holy Spirit. And I go, how did we get there? So, so repentance is up for grabs. We, we might need to do that. Baptism, it's, it's up for grabs. We, we, maybe. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, if you're charismatic. Like, like, where do we, we, we kind of we move from this? That's the great commission that we memorize when we're little kids. That Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Every ounce and authority. You think you have rights? You have no rights. I have every right. Every bit of authority has been given to me. I just rose from the grave to give you this message. That's how powerful I am. And he says, now you go and make disciples. You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the age. And we memorize that. And yet how many of us have ever even baptized a person or taught anyone to obey the things of God? Some of you are here at Bible college studying. And yet you'll go through four years of Bible training, ministry training without baptizing one person or making one disciple. And you can justify it. Well, that's not really time to do right now. You know, it's, 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 it's a study time. This is a time where we, we kind of get away. And I'm going, no, you, you can have as many people as you want will tell you it's okay to do what you're doing. But deep in your heart, as you read the scripture, you know it doesn't make sense that a block down the street, you, you, you know, you have some of the people in the most difficult situations. 
many of whom have never heard the, the truth, many of them who are headed for an eternity apart from God, and in your soul, in your spirit. See, these are the things that I didn't have peace with. I thought, man, if I really believed that guy right there was going to spend eternity apart from God, man, it seems like I would do something or say something or just try anything to get to that person. Everyone said, well, you know, that's not really your role. You're a pastor. I'm like, what? That makes sense to you? I, I made it make sense for me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You're right. I preach to the people, and that's their job. And I'm just saying, no, as a human being, and as a Christian, I think, man, I, I should have a compassion for them. I should be figuring out a way to speak, but the truth is, is I, I hate sharing my faith. I'd rather do just about anything than go up to a stranger and tell them about Jesus. And that's the truth. I'd rather try to run a triathlon. <laughs> you know, seriously. Or pet a cat. <laughs> you know, there's, there's just not a whole lot I'm trying to think, like, what? It's, it's hard. It's, it's not painting the cat. It's, it's hard to. I'm just thinking, what, what is there on earth that I would rather not do? Rather than preach a message that I know is going to be rejected by the majority of people that I share with. Um, cause them to not like me and to inconvenience them and annoy them with the time. Let's just face it. It's, it's difficult. We'd rather do just about anything else. And so we'll busy ourselves with other things and say, well, that's basically baptizing someone. And I'm going, no, it's not. I, I, I remember um, when I was a young pastor, I, I went to this conference and a pastor was sharing about his Christmas program. And it was an awesome Christmas program. Nothing wrong with Christmas programs. I was grateful for what he did. He talked about the hundreds of thousands of dollars they spent to make it excellent. He talked about church members coming to the, to the church building 15 hours a week for months to rehearse this Christmas musical so that they could fill up that place several times and, and people would get saved. And it was a great thing. I was, only a Christian, I was only a pastor for a couple years, and so I went up to the guy after. I'm like, hey, that was really cool, but let me ask you something. You know, you had all these people coming to the church building, you know, over 15 hours a week. I go, what if they had spent those 15 hours a week getting to know their neighbors and actually talking to their neighbors and inviting them over for dinner and them telling them about Jesus? I go, wouldn't there be so much more fruit and it's free? And, and, and I still remember what he said to me. He goes, he said, of course. But people won't do that. And I remember looking at him, and my response was, oh, yeah, you're right. See, but now my response is different. Now my response is, well, that's stupid. So, so we have to change this whole system of the way we do things because we're scared to go and build relationships with people and look people in the eyes, you know, as a fellow human being going, man, I, I actually like you as my neighbor. Let me tell you the most important thing in my life. But because we're uncomfortable doing that and we wouldn't want to make you uncomfortable, let's create another system where it doesn't take faith, it doesn't take courage, because no, I won't share my faith, but I'll dress up like a reindeer and sing Silent Night, you know, okay, come do that, come do that. We'll change this whole system so that we don't require courage anymore. And we don't actually have to go out and make disciples. So you just bring them in the room. We'll lead them to the Lord through some musical. Our staff will disciple them. We'll disciple your kids. We'll disciple your youth. We'll disciple the women. We'll disciple the men. Let us take care of it. And I'm just going, man, no, we got to get back to the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists, the apostles, the training up, equipping the, the saints for the work of service, that you would go out and make disciples. Yeah. 
I was with one of my good friends at, at the subway station there in San Francisco, and all these people are coming out. And he goes, man, I'm just thinking about standing there with a sign that says, if you have any questions about God, just ask me. And, and uh, he goes, what do you think? I'm not saying, hey, you're all going to hell. It's not going to say that. It's just, if you got questions, ask me. He goes, what do you think? I go, man, that's great. If that's what the Lord's called you to, I go, but you know what bothers me? It's like, look, all these people coming out of the subway. Every one of them works with a Christian. Everyone lives on a block where there's a Christian. But because that Christian isn't making the effort to build relationship and actually hang out and go to lunch with them and, and tell them about Jesus, man, their only hope is some guy with a sign or maybe that they'll get invited to a Christmas program. I go instead, man, those people have the greatest opportunity. They work side by side with this person to show them a life that's different and to look them in the eyes and go, man, you know me, man. Let me just tell you what changed my life. But they're not going to do it, so yeah, go make your sign. And I'm just going, no, I, I really think this next generation is one that's saying, no, it's time to change that. You know, it's time to get out there. And I, I, I think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, he says, I'm free from everyone, but I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became like one outside the law, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some, and I do it all for the sake of the gospel. He goes, man, I, he goes, when I'm over with the Jews, you know what I do? I mean, I, I just, I got to fit in with them. And I'm walking over with a pork chop. Hey, what's up, guys? He goes, I just think, man, hey, brought you some bagels. Hey, I, I, I just go and I just fit in. He goes, why? He goes, I, I want to get in that circle. Why? Because I want to win some of them. And then if, if, they're, if they're not under the law, then I go, I hang out with them, and I do what they do. You know, and those, those over there that are strong, I go work out with those who are weak. I, I go, you know, play chess. We, we do. I just get into all of these worlds. Paul's like, man, I am going to just try to get into that guy's world. I'm going to get into that girl's world. I'm going to make myself a slave to them. See, that's something we don't talk about in the church enough. That, that one of the biggest problems in the church is that we're so weird. We're so weird in ways that God has not called us to be weird. And then when we finally fit in, it's in the places where God's called us to stand out as lights. And, and, and it's, it's like, man, we got to get into their worlds. And, and I mean, some of you are working in these places I could never get into. And I just remember people in my own congregation goes, oh, Francis, I want to take you to work with me so you can share with my friends. And I'm like, man, don't you get it? They already trust you. I'm supposed to equip you to go and, and you go and make these disciples. And I'm supposed to train you to, to, to stand on your own two feet. And, I, and I, I just challenge you. I mean, I don't know of a greater location for a Bible college. In, in every college I've been to, I, I can't think of a better location. You guys are in the heart of Chicago. That's insane. You just walk outside and it's just all around you. And I just go, man, are you taking advantage of that? Are you doing everything you can to fit in, to get in their circles, getting jobs by here, and building relationships? Why? So that you can win some of them. But some of us, man, our only relationships are in the church. Um, it's a lot easier in the church. Some of your only friends are in the church because it's so much easier because they have to be your friend or it's a sin. <laughs> and it's just true. And out in the world, though, it's not that way. It's like you actually have to be interesting. You actually have to get into their world and actually love them and give to them and care for them. 
And it's, and it's time that we go, you know what, I'm going to make that effort. I'm going to get, this is so uncomfortable. And let's just talk about that elephant in the room. That, that's, the fact is, we don't like to do that. It is so much harder. I don't like conflict. I want to be in a circle with people who all believe the way that I do. But that's not what we're called to right now. We go and we become like the people who are different from us. Man, and I, what I see in Scripture is that even the apostles were scared. And Peter and John, even though you get, no, but in, in Acts 4 it says that, that the world was astonished by their boldness. A few verses later, they get out of prison, and what do they do? They get with the other believers and do what? They pray for greater courage. And then the Holy Spirit falls upon them. The place shakes, and they leave and preach more boldly. And, and I think about the Apostle Paul himself, who at the end of his letter goes, pray for me, you guys. You've got to pray for me that I might preach the gospel boldly as I ought. Paul? Paul asked for prayers of courage. Paul's like, man, sometimes I just, I, I, I chicken out. Paul? And as those early believers got together and they prayed for that courage, that's what we need to start doing. It's not changing the whole system to where it doesn't require courage, but praying for one another and saying, man, I, I haven't done anything in my workplace. I got neighbors on both sides of me and I've never told them about Jesus. I've never made the effort to build the relationship. All I do is just hang out with other believers, people that I'm comfortable with. I'm not pushing it. I'm not going for it. I'm not living by faith. Okay. Let me just close with this. I don't even know if I already ran out of time. <laughs> but um, let me say two or three things. Okay. Uh, I just remember, okay, some of you guys followed my journey. Like, I was pastor of this church, you know, 17 years. Wonderful. Love these people. But it was just time. It was, it was you know, you just, there's just this overwhelming sense. Like, I've, everyone in this city has heard my voice. Um, and there are plenty of pastors in this city. And it's the safest city, in a large city in America. So, you know, anyone would want to get a job there and raise their family everything else. So I, I think I'm done there. My wife felt the same thing. So we took off, and, and uh, we just sold everything, which is amazing because my wife was pregnant. She's got four kids, and go, let's just sell the house and see where the Lord leads us. I'm like, man, you're awesome. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we sell that. Ah, she's, a, she's just an amazing woman. I mean, even after our, our fifth child is born, you know, she has a 16-year-old, she got an eight-month-old, you know, and she just goes, gosh, I'm just looking at all of our kids. We're doting on the baby. And she goes, I just thought that's not fair. That, 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 that baby gets so much love, and there's all these other kids that get no love. Can we adopt? <laughs> wow, that is an amazing perspective. Yeah, absolutely. They'll adopt as many as you want. You know, let's go for it. All these half a million foster kids that no one wants. That doesn't make any sense if we have millions of Christians out here and God says it's true religion to care for the widows and orphans. Let's just, let's just go for it. I mean, my friends, my friends, Domingo and Irene, they were over the other day. They have 11 kids that they adopted out of the foster. 11. And they're about 59, 60 years old. And they just adopted 11 kids. Because they just look at James 1, they go, well, when we take that literally, I, I, don't, I don't get why we wouldn't. And I just go, man, I, I don't know how you do it. He's a mechanic, she's a hairdresser. They just take the word of God literally. And say, no, let's just do it. Let's just go for it. But I remember when we were, you know, we were in China, India, we just saw just the most beautiful, wonderful believers just that would give everything where you go, okay, they popped out of this book. They totally popped out of this book. I could write about your story, your story, your story, and it would fit right in here. It makes sense. And, 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 and we so wanted to stay there in Asia, but I had this sense which God was calling us back to the States. I just felt like there's some things I needed to do, you know, regarding discipleship and the church. And, and, and I, I just, ah, oh man, we're going back. And I remember sitting at the airport in China and looking at my family, my wife and my two oldest girls, at least, and we're just going, man, what do we do, you guys? It's been such an amazing journey, but I believe God's calling us back to the U.S. And, and I'm just scared that we're going to get sucked right back into this comfortable, easy life because we can. 
And, and we're going to, you know, leave this life of adventure. And, and, you know, and my daughter had a few words to say. And then my wife she just chimed in. She goes, Francis, just whatever we do, you guys, whatever happens, let's not let people talk us out of things this time. We get in the scriptures and we, we get convicted about things. And then the moment someone hears about something we want to do, they try to talk us out of it. And sometimes we listen. We got to stop listening to that. There's a time to stop listening. There's a time where it just says, you know, that's what the Word of God says. Now let's go for it. Let's just do it. Amen. And here's what I want to say. First, to you, a lot of college students in here, and I'm sure at this satellite room, because you're always late. <laughs> I'm talking about doing something that requires faith, that's just nuts. You know, and all I can say to you is if you are not living by faith now, just forget it. Do you know how much harder it's going to be once you have responsibilities? I, I mean, it's, it's insane. This is the freest time of your life. You know, I mean, if you can't live by faith now and risk while all you have is your own life to risk, wait till you get married. And then suddenly it's like, well, I'm not just thinking about myself. Wait till you have a kid. And it's so much harder. Wait till you have a couple of them. I mean, if you're not living by faith and just going for it, seeing things the Word of God says, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to believe in it. I mean, I would just take this book literally and just go, man, I, I don't know no one's doing this, but it sure seems like that's what the Word of God says. And I, I, I'm so grateful for the times when I actually did take this step of faith. Why didn't it talk, get talked out of it? And when I didn't talk myself out of it, I just thought, man, that's what the Word of God says. I'm just going to do it. I mean, I, I, I would take this so literally. I remember reading that passage, even as a kid, about faith being able to move mountains. And I still remember going into my room and trying to move stuff. Just kind of, <laughs> you know, just start with like a pencil or something, you know. And, and oh, man, I don't get it. I, I mean, it's just, and I get now that, you know, in a way, it's not just so you can do tricks, you know. It's, it's, it's for the sake of the gospel, and there may be a time when God calls me to do something supernatural like that, and I want to have the faith to do it. Um, but I'm just saying, man, go, take this book, literally, do it, do it. I mean, trust when no one else is willing to trust. It's amazing, and now is the time. But I, in closing, I do want to say, I, I, I didn't expect... Um, this many uh, mature believers, that's a political way to say it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know why I wasn't thinking that when I came here today, but I do want to say something to you. And understand, it's hard for me to say some of these things. I grew up in a very Asian home that's just, you respect the elderly like crazy. You don't ever confront them. You, you just do whatever they say, even if they're wrong. That's the upbringing I had. And so I have respect for my elders. That's why I'm in a suit, because they asked me to. Okay? <laughs> so understand, I am one that is all about respecting authority, respecting the elderly. And yet in Scripture, I do see that it is still my place in love with respect to still confront sin, no matter how old or young the person is. And I just want to respectfully say, um, I meet very few elderly people whose lives make sense to me, biblically. Because I'm 44 years old, and every year, I think to myself, I was thinking about it today, I just, I, I think about how I am closer and closer to the end of it all. I have so many friends who have passed away that are younger than me. And I go, man, any moment I'm going to see you, God. And I check my life. I go, is there anything I haven't surrendered? Anything I, I don't want to be holding on to this stuff. It's like that game, Hot Potato. You know, remember we used to play that? We just don't want it. You know, you want to just pass it. I, kids have no clue what I'm talking about because there's no app for it. Um, <laughs> but it's, 
you know, there was this game we played called Hot Potato. I don't know what we played with, like a ball or whatever. You just, you just passed it to the next guy because when the music ended or whatever, you didn't want it in your hands. I almost feel like that way with my possessions and my stuff. Like, I want to give it. I want to give it. I want to care for the poor. I don't want to, at the end, have all this stuff hoarded, saved, doing nothing. And so I'm constantly looking at my life saying, God, is there, I want to be ready to face you. And so I want to risk it all. I want to risk it all. Because, man, I'm 44. I don't know how much longer I have. And every year goes faster, doesn't it? Someone, someone told me, they, you know, someone said, you know, it's, it's like, he says, every, every, he goes, think of it, every year is like another, like if, if you're 10 years old, it's like you're moving 10 miles an hour to get through the year. So then once you're 30, it's like you're moving 30 miles an hour. Like, oh, that's pretty comfortable. And then after a while, it's like, dang, that year, is it already 2012? You know, I'm going 44 miles an hour. Some of you are breaking the speed limit already, you know? <laughs> and it's just like, boom, boom. And, and I think, okay, and here, let me, let me just close it. Respectfully, I don't meet a lot of elderly that are really living like they're about to see Jesus and, and saying goodbye to the things of this world and letting go of that stuff. I, I mean, how, honestly, I mean, how, how can you not be thinking about that and risking more than ever? Some of you are still buying stuff like you're going to enjoy it for a long I, I'm sorry, and saving some of the stuff. And I just think, man, my life has been about letting go, letting go, letting go, because I'm going, man, I'm getting closer and closer to the end, and I want to live by more and more faith every year. And I just think we've been living so backwards in the States, where we do everything crazy when we're 18, and we go, oh, yeah, I was crazy back then. You know, I'd go on mission trips, and I would, you know, and we would talk about, oh, those good old days. And I'm just saying, man, doesn't it make more sense that the older we get, the more we realize, okay, this, this world has nothing left for me. And then we just start going nuts and uh, pouring in and, and showing that lifestyle to these young whippersnappers, you know? <laughs> and I, I just think the world, the church, is in dire need of elderly people that are living radically for their faith. And some of these young people are dying to come under the tutelage of elderly people that seriously cannot wait to see Jesus and are living that way. So let me pray for us. Father, I, I ask that you make sense of everything that was spoken here by your spirit, God. May we be doers of the word, God, not people that just amen and say, oh yeah, that was good. But Lord, when we leave this room, may we take steps of faith. God, when we look at the lost and do everything we can to get into the world so we might win some of them. God, we're getting good as a church of gathering in buildings like this. It's, it's when we leave, God, to be people who are filled with your spirit, courageous, God, admitting that we get scared. Lord, I hate being rejected. I hate looking stupid, God. And yet I look in the scriptures, and that's, that's what happened. I mean, godly people get persecuted. They get rejected. Jesus himself was hated by the world. And so we should not be surprised when the world hates us. But may it not be because of our arrogance, um, our lack of love, our judgmental attitude. May it only be because of the gospel. And so, God, I pray that you give us ears to hear. Purify your church, Lord, please. In Jesus' name, amen.